Hello and welcome to this tutorial where I'll be going through more examples of hypothesis testing for normal distributions following this format that we used in the previous tutorial. And in today's tutorial, we'll be looking at both one-tailed and two-tailed tests. Let's have a look at the first question. So here we're told that the scores of students follow a normal distribution. The national mean score in GCSE mathematics is 4.73 with a standard deviation of 1.21. In a particular school, 50 students were randomly selected and their means were found to be 4.81. Test at the 5% significance level whether the national average score has increased. So using our method, the first thing we need to do is define the null hypothesis H0. And since we've been told that the mean score is 4.73, then the null hypothesis mu is equal to 4.73. Next, we need to define the alternate hypothesis H1 and then determine the tail of the test. Now, remembering that the key thing that we have to look out for is what we've been asked to test. Well, here we've been asked to test whether the average score has increased. So the alternate hypothesis would be that mu is greater than 4.73 and therefore this would be a one tail test. We can tell which tail to focus on by noticing that the sample mean given in the question 4.81 is greater than the population mean which is 4.73. So this tells us that we need to look at the upper tail illustrated by this green shaded area under the normal curve, which is the p-value that we're going to calculate later. Next, we need to define the population distribution. So if we call X, capital X, the scores of the students, then X is normally distributed with a mean of 4.73 and a variance of 1.21 squared. Next, we need to define the sampling distribution of sample means. And we can define this as capital X bar, which would also be normally distributed with the same mean of 4.73. And the variance would be the variance 1.21 squared over N, where N is the sample size, which in this case was 50. And therefore the standard deviation sigma would be the square root of this value, 1.21 divided by the square root of 50. And working this out in the calculator, we would get a value of 0 0.17 and so on. At this stage, you might also find it useful to write the sample mean, which comes from this sampling distribution, which we can write as small x bar is equal to 4.81. And we're going to use this for the next part, which is arguably the most important part of this test, calculating the p-value. So here I've just written the definition of a p-value, which we'll be referring to the probability of finding the observed value or a more extreme value using the null hypothesis. So using this definition, we need to work out the probability of X bar being greater than or equal to 4.81 using the null hypothesis. Now we're calculating the probability of all values greater than or equal to 4.81 because the claim of the alternate hypothesis was that the mean score was greater than 4.73. So anything greater than 4.81 would certainly be deemed as a more extreme value. As mentioned in the previous tutorial, if in doubt, if it's a one-tailed test, just use the same sign as the one you've used for the alternate hypothesis, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and use a calculator to work out this p-value. Right, so we need to go to menu, press seven for distribution. And as it's an inequality, we need to press two for normal CD, which stands for normal cumulative distribution. Since we're trying to work out the probability of observed values of 4.81 and higher, the lower value we should choose is 4.81. And for the upper value, we can choose some really large positive value, say a million. 
Now we know that the standard deviation of the sampling distribution was 0 0.17 and so on. And if you're comfortable with working this value out, storing it in your calculator and calling it here, then feel free to do so. Alternatively, you can actually put the actual calculation directly into the calculator because you generally want to avoid rounding at this stage. Okay, so I'm going to put 1.21 divided by the square root of 50 and press equals and you can see that you get 0 0.1711 and it doesn't display all of the values but be sure that now we have the correct standard deviation. For the mean, we need to choose 4.73, which was the same mean for the original distribution and precisely the part where we'll be using the null hypothesis. So let's just enter 4.73. And if we press equals, we get that the probability is equal to 0 0.32 and so on. Okay. So given the fact that the probability of X bar being greater than or equal to 4.81 is equal to 0 0.32 and so on, we need to compare this P value with the significance level, which was given as 5%. And this will allow us to determine whether the P value is small or large. Since 0 0.32 and so on is greater than 5% or 0 0.05, we can conclude that the p-value is large, meaning that the null hypothesis gave us a calculation which tells us that there's a high likelihood of observing an average score of 4.81 or higher. Now, when we took a sample of 50 students, we saw that indeed this happened, meaning that the calculation is reliable. And since we used the null hypothesis for this calculation, this is why we would accept the null hypothesis. And to round off with a conclusive statement, we can say that there is therefore not enough evidence to suggest that the mean is greater than 4.73. Okay, let's have a look at the next question. Okay, so the diameters of circular cardboard drinks mats produced by a certain machine are normally distributed with a mean of nine centimeters and a standard deviation of 0 0.15 centimeters. After the machine is serviced, a random sample of 30 mats is selected and their diameters are measured to see if the mean diameter has altered. The mean of the sample was 8.95 centimeters. Test at the 5% level whether there is significant evidence of a change in the mean diameter of mats produced by the machine. Okay, so this is a slightly more wordy question. However, we should be able to extract the important parts of the question and use this method to conduct a hypothesis test. Okay, so like before, the first thing we need to do is define the null hypothesis, H0. And since we're told that the mean is nine centimeters, the null hypothesis mu is equal to nine. Next, we need to define the alternate hypothesis and the tail of the test. Now in this question, we have been asked to test whether there has been a change in the mean diameter. And when you see keywords such as change or different or altered, this indicates that the alternate hypothesis that we should use is that mu is not equal to nine, okay? And in cases like this, you would have a two-tailed test. Now for two-tailed tests, it's often a misconception that you need to focus on both the upper tail and the lower tail. But just like a one tail test, you need to first of all compare the sample mean with the population mean and then choose whether to focus on the upper tail or the lower tail, not both. Now here we see that the sample mean is 8.95, which is less than nine, the population mean. And so we need to focus on or calculate the p-value of the lower tail represented by this green shaded area under the normal curve. So the only difference between a one tail test and a two tail test is that once we calculate our p-value for the two tail test, instead of comparing this value with 5%, the significance level given in the question, we would be comparing the p-value with half of 5%, which is 2.5%, okay? 
so next we need to define the population distribution and if we call x the diameter of mats then we can say that x is normally distributed with a mean of 9 and a variance of 0 0.15 squared the sampling distribution of sample means would be defined as follows x bar is normally distributed with a mean of 9 and the variance would be the variance 0 0.15 squared divided by n where n is the sample size which was 30 in this case okay we can calculate the standard deviation sigma by taking the square root of this value giving us 0 0.15 divided by the square root of 30 and if you work this out in your calculator you would get 0 0.02 and so on we know the sample mean in this scenario was 8.95 and so to calculate the p-value using the definition we need to calculate the probability of x bar being less than or equal to 8.95 given the null hypothesis now since we can't use this sign to tell us which direction this inequality should be this is where we need to use the fact that we are trying to work out the p-value for the lower tail as I mentioned earlier another way you can look at it is that since the sample mean 8.95 is less than 9 the population mean anything less than this value would be seen as a more extreme value hence why we take this probability and so using the calculator to work out this probability we would go to menu click 7 for distribution click 2 for normal CD and since we're trying to work out the probability of getting observed values of 8.95 or lower we can choose some really large negative lower value say negative a million and our upper value would be 8.95 the standard deviation we would use would be the one which comes from the sampling distribution and we can enter this calculation straight in to get the right value 0 0.15 divided by the square root of 30 and that gives us 0 0.027 and so on for the mean we would use the population mean which was 9 okay so working this out we get a value of 0 0.033 and so on and so given the fact that the probability of x bar being less than or equal to 8.95 is equal to 0 0.033 and so on we need to compare this p-value with a significance level of 2.5 percent this time which is half of five percent and since 0 0.033 and so on is greater than 2.5% or 0.025 we can conclude that this p-value is large in this context and since the p-value is greater than the significance level for the very same reasons as a previous example we should accept the null hypothesis which means that there is not enough evidence to suggest that there has been a change in the mean diameter of mats okay so I hope that was useful for you. Join us for the next tutorial where I'll be showing you how to conduct hypothesis testing using critical values. Until then, keep up the good work and I'll see you in the next tutorial. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up, leave your comments down below and subscribe to this channel so you'll be the first to know when we release our next videos.